Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Loriano, and I serve as the Programs Manager for the DC Preservation League. Um, for those of you new to DCPL, we are a citywide nonprofit organization founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of Washington, DC through advocacy and education. So I'd like to take a moment to first acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Denton's, Douglas Development, Intunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Tracery, Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. So many thanks to you all for your dedication to preservation. So with that, I'm so pleased to introduce you all to today's presenters. John D. Ferrari was born and raised in Washington, DC and has a lifelong passion for local history. He has a master's degree in English literature from Harvard University and has worked for many years for the federal government. In addition to penning the popular Streets of Washington blog, DeFerrari is a trustee of the DC Preservation League and the author of three books, Lost Washington, D.C., published in 2011, Historic Restaurants of Washington, D.C., Capital Eats, published in 2013, and Capital Streetcars, Early Mass Transit in Washington, D.C., published in 2015. Peter Sefton is a member of the DC, if, of, sorry, of the DCPO Board of Trustees and serves as the chair of the organization's Landmarks Committee. He became actively involved in, histor in historic preservation in 2002 when he founded the Victorian Secrets of Washington, D.C. internet site to memorialize demolished buildings and publicize threats to vintage buildings of all types. In 2002, he also became active with the DC Preservation League, joining its board of trustees and becoming chair of its landmarks committee in 2007. He has researched the history of many buildings in the course of preparing numerous nominations to the DC Inventory of Historic Sites and National Register of Historic Places. So with that, I'm excited to pass things along to John first. Thanks, Melissa. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Of course, it's great for both Peter and, and me to, to be here, uh, particularly because this is sponsored by DC Preservation League, which we're really is dear to our hearts and, and we really enjoy and, and, and fervently support the, the work that it does. So um, today we're talking, of course, about uh, our new book that Peter and I have written on uh, 16th Street, uh, the history of 16th Street. And uh, here, my the way we're going to do this, we're going to we've decided to split it in two parts. And I'm going to start by talking about um, uh, houses of worship, as you see on the screen here. And then Peter's going to pick up, and he's going to talk about some of the great uh, uh, houses and mansions on on the street. So the book um, the book is really a uh, we we designed it as a, a biography of the street. Uh, it's the whole history of 16th Street from the very beginning, around 1800, when L'Enfant laid it out as a street that didn't exist at all in, in, the, in the landscape, um, all the way through up through the 20th century and all the development to the, to the Maryland border, uh, the full six and a half, seven miles or so. Um, it's quite a, quite a long avenue, has, has a lot of rich history. And today we're, we're gonna focus on these two uh, sort of subsets with a little bit of an architectural focus um, on, on uh, yeah, houses of worship and, and other houses. So um, with that intro, I'll jump in here. You, you see in the background here, a view of, um, from the Kennesaw apartment building looking south on 16th and, and you see the steeples of three of the, of the uh, prestigious, uh, Houses of Worship on 16th Street, the, the first, uh, uh, I mean, the National Baptist Church on the left, and then All Souls uh, Unitarian Church in the center, and the, the former uh, Washington Chapel of the Mormon Church on the right. So I'll talk a little bit more about a, a couple of those uh, in a minute. Uh, first, I thought I would just address the issue that people always ask, why are there so many houses of worship on 16th Street? What is it about 16th Street that 
has attracted them? And uh, there isn't any simple answer to that question. It's really a confluence of, of several th factors. Uh, first off, 16th Street is one of the few north-south streets that was designated by Peter L'Enfant when he designed the, 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 the core of Washington City that he de designated as one of the Grand Avenues. We think of places like Pennsylvania Avenue, Massachusetts Avenue, the other state named avenues as being the Grand Avenues, but there are also uh, a couple of North-South streets, uh, North Capitol and South Capitol uh, from obviously running uh, from, the, from the Capitol North-South and then 16th Street, which runs directly north from the White House. So, um, so that's why 16th is, is a grand avenue according to the plan. Um, so that makes it a prestigious street. It's the, the fact that it's directly linked to the White House uh, uh, adds to the, to the prestige of being on 16th Street. And uh, another key factor in, in, in the history of 16th Street is the fact that it has always been non-commercial or almost always in, in, in terms of the, how buildings have, have been developed. It was, um, uh, the street did not get a lot of build, building structures on it until the late 19th century. And then early in the 20th, around 1905, the first restriction, formal legal restriction on commercial development was put in place on 16th Street. And that was a good 15 years before any other uh, uh, commercial uh, or zoning uh, regulations were, were instituted in the city. So 16th had a running start, it was non-commercial and it's pretty much stayed that way through its whole history. So that's another big reason why, why churches and other houses of worship want to be on, um, on 16th Street. And of course, it's also, it's a central street. It's easy for people to get to. Uh, so, so those are some reasons. Um, with that, I will jump in and start uh, talking about some of the some of the key um, buildings on the street. And oops, I went a little one too far. I want to start here. Um, St. John's Church, right at the end of 16th at uh, 16th and H, directly on the other side of, of Lafayette Square is uh, not only the first church on 16th Street, it's also the first substantial structure of any kind that was built. Um, by far the oldest building on the street. Uh, it was built in 1816, as it says there. And uh, this, is a, this is a kind of a charming drawing that was made not long after the church was first built. And you see uh, 16th Street is, is a dirt path. <laughs> running from the, uh, from the White House north. And uh, Lafayette Park has not even yet been designated or laid out at all. And uh, the White House, you can see, is also not looking terribly good shape there. It's still in partial ruins from the, the British uh, uh, attack and burning of the White House and the Capitol in 1814. So this is only a couple of years later and they haven't rebuilt it yet. But our focus is on, is on the church here. This was designed by Benjamin Henry Latrobe, uh, the famous architect, considered the first professional architect of America. Uh, and it's a beautiful gem of a building. As you can see in this early drawing, it was, it was Latrobe designed it as a symmetrical um, uh, Greek cross type building. It's almost almost square with those projecting uh, uh, porticos, if you will, on all four sides. And inside the auditorium is circular. So it's a very, um, very much an enlightenment design for a house of worship. There's no long nave. There's no separation of priests from, from congregation. Um, this is, this is the, the enlightenment view that the um, that the, uh, the ministers and, and, and congregations would all be together in the center. And it's a building that was filled with light. Uh, you see that large uh, cupola or, or lantern, as it's called, that allows light into the center of the auditorium and the, the windows. It was a very light and airy um, 
space that that Latrobe built. And it didn't actually stay completely like this for a long time. Here's a, a photo of Lafayette Square, as it says, 1858 or so. And you can see that that a long uh, nave has been added onto, onto the front of the church with a column portico and, and, a, uh, and a bell tower. So this um, kind of threw out a whack the symmetry of Latrobe's original design, but it has created the church that, that we know today. Um, and this was, we, we don't know exactly who the architect was. Uh, we know that Charles Bolfinch uh, was, was asked to do a design for the church around, around the time that this extension was done, in, uh, which was uh, in the 1820s. Um, but we're not sure if this, if this final design that was built was actually Bullfinch's. In any event, um, this is how the church developed. And there would be lots of alterations through the years after this, through the 19th century, lots of, lots of changes, lots of rethinking of, of design parameters. At one point, the clear light open windows were, began to be replaced with, with uh, um, uh, stained glass windows and a lot of additional decoration was added. The church actually became rather dark on the inside, contrary to what Latrobe would have wanted. And eventually in the 20th century, some of that, a fair amount of that was removed to, to give it back its, its airiness. Um, and, uh, and we end up with what we have today here, uh, St. John's the photo I took uh, last year. And of course, as, as everyone knows, St. John's is, has remained at the center of the street and, um, and politics even uh, to this day. Uh, this is the lower two blocks of 16th Street, as everyone knows, are now officially Black Lives Matter Plaza after the demonstrations and uh, uh, that happened in, in uh, 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. So, and, and this, of course, this church uh, was infamously the site where the, uh, the president went and held up a Bible after, after uh, the demonstrators had been pushed back uh, violently from, from their spots there on, on 16th on Black Lives Matter Plaza. So um, not something that the church had, had any uh, wish to, to, to play that role, but it demonstrates the centrality of, of St. John's, a church that's been attended by all the presidents since Madison. And uh, the, the first big building on, on 16th and remaining to this day, uh, really important. Uh, I'll move on from there and talk next about, we'll go up the street a ways to, uh, to 16th and Corcoran. And this is, this is about between Q and R, if you don't know where Corcoran is. And here we see the wonderful Church of the Holy City built in 1896. This is a grand building. That tower is just magnificent. And this is the first national church on 16th, of which there are, there are a bunch of them. And that, when I say national church, church, I mean that the congregation here specifically had aspirations that this building uh, would represent the denomination for the, for the country in some degree. And uh, lots of contributions were taken in from folks around the country to pay for it. So this is the, the National Church of the Swedenborgian faith, and that is a, a, uh, a longstanding uh, uh, sect that was founded at, shortly after the death of the philosopher and theologian Emanuel Swedenborg, died in 1772. He was born in Sweden. He moved to, to England and did a lot of his work there. And his, his admirers and, and supporters founded the Swedenborgian faith after he passed away. And they, they believe in a very rational uh, type of, of Christian faith. Um, and, uh, and, and they have, had been in the city for a long time. Their first church was downtown. They had a church that burned in, in 1889, burned down in 1889. It was down near 
Pennsylvania Avenue uh, below the Capitol. And they needed a new spot and they decided uh, they, they purchased this uh, plot here with the intention of building a national church. They, uh, they hired on the influential Boston architect, H. Langford Warren uh, to design the church. Warren was a, a very influential uh, Boston architect. He was a founder of Harvard's architecture school and uh, became very uh, influential, particularly in the arts and crafts movement. Uh, for this church, he, he used the English Gothic revival style, as you can see there, with, with again, that magnificent tower with the flamboyant uh, Gothic uh, windows in it. It was originally actually supposed to be uh, a lot taller still. There was supposed to be a, 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 a tower rising from the top, uh, a conical spire um, rising much higher uh, that was never actually built. And the church is, is, is very interesting. You, you notice that the front, uh, the, um, the, 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 the front facade is kind of peeking out almost from behind the tower that even though we're looking at an angle, it still does that even face on. It's, it's an interesting effect uh, that, it, that it has. And uh, it has many different uh, sort of quirky features. One of them next to it on, on the other side here, you can't see it in this photo, there is a small uh, a chapter house that was added in 1911 that uh, Warren also worked on. And it has a, this wonderful uh, stairwell that I thought I would throw in because it has this, this distinctive arts and crafts look to it. Um, and it shows, again, this is, it's made of, of brick, as you can see, the tower, and it's it's simple and in materials um, uh, showing the the desire of the congregation to be um, to not be overly ostentatious, despite the the look of the of the church as a whole, um, but but nevertheless very high quality work. Um, so so uh, so that's the Church of the Holy City. And um, as I said, that was the first national church down here in the lower part of 16th Street. There were some others, uh, major churches, the First Baptist Church, uh, the, the, uh, the um, Foundry Methodist Church, uh, the Universalist Church. There, there are a scattering of, of churches on the lower part of 16th, but the real um, uh, development of lots of, of houses of worship happened up beyond Meridian Hill starting in the 1920s. And so I want to move now to All Souls Unitarian Church, which is on at, at Harvard Street. Uh, we saw it in the center of our original photo there when, when I started the talk. And All Souls was, was built in 1924. And similar to St. John's in a way, is neoclassical in design. Well, this, this church is really modeled on one in England, uh, St. Martin in the Fields on Trafalgar Square in, in London. And it reflects, or it was intended really to reflect the, the Unitarian ideas and ideals which trace back to New England. And this, this church has something of that uh, New England church uh, appearance. So the Unitarians were, have been in Washington for a long time, since 1822. This is their, they're celebrating their bicentennial. They have a new uh, history out of the, of the church for, uh, recognizing the bicentennial. And they were downtown at a couple of different locations and uh, needed, to, needed to expand. They were getting more, more members. They were previously in a, in a tall, Victorian church at 14 the L that had been built in 1878 and they were looking for a new church they eventually ended up at this spot and they hired uh, another Boston architect Henry Shepley to to do this design um, so uh, the as I said this one was built in 1924 and and also reflects those neoclassical uh, uh, principles and 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 the um, the uh, 
the intention for for enlightenment and clarity and avoiding the icons and and features of of uh, the Catholic Church and others. So we can see that in in the interior. Here's a view of of the interior of the church, and you notice there are no uh, icons or pictures or symbols of any kind. It's a very plain, very neoclassical look. Um, and also very light and airy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we see that again, uh, as we did at St. John's. Uh, I'll mention that All Souls Unitarian is a very active congregation and is noted for all of the um, involvement it has had in, in, in society and, and, and working for equity and equality. Um, it was, uh, it's been a really a pivotal force for social justice beginning in the 1950s. It uh, was the source, uh, uh, the, the minister of the church led folks down in the march on Washington for jobs and freedom in 1963 to the, to the mall uh, to hear Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And um, it was this was the church where um, the Reverend James Reeb had had uh, served for a while before he uh, went down to Selma, Alabama, to participate in civil rights protests and and was unfortunately uh, killed down there. Uh, so he's one of their their uh, well known uh, former uh, ministers. And uh, beyond the civil rights uh, acts, which I'm just just touching on very briefly, it's also been uh, the auditorium connected to this church was a place where some groundbreaking uh, uh, entertainment was uh, took place. This is where uh, jazz musicians Charlie Bird and Stan Getz recorded their famous um, jazz sam samba album, the uh, which introduced Bossa Nova to to American uh, listeners. So, um, so lots of connections to the social world with this church. The across the street from All Souls is the former Mormon Washington Chapel built in 1933, now, uh, now uh, used by the Unification Church. And this is really one of the jewels of, of 16th Street, beautiful building. Um, that was uh, uh, built, as I said, built in 1933 and designed in, in a very eye-catching uh, Utah bird's eye travertine marble that has this very warm uh, glow to it, if you will. And the design is, is uh, it was, it the architect was Don Carlos Young, um, who happened to be a grandson of Brigham Young. And uh, the, the overall design is, is reminiscent of the Morgan Tabernacle in Salt Lake City. Uh, it has this very interesting mix of styles. It has definitely a, a Art Deco feel to it. You can see the ziggurats on the, on the, uh, um, on the, on the towers there that, that are very much Art Deco in, 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 in reference. Um, it has the, the windows are, you know, evocative of the Gothic style. It has some, some classical elements too, some, some the pediments here that have uh, neoclassical uh, capitals. So it's a, it's a mix of styles. It's, it's a charming building. It's interesting that, it, that it's here at all, actually. Uh, the, since the 1920s, the Mormon church was looking to build a, a church in Washington, and they were having a hard time finding a spot because uh, there was a lot of prejudice against the church. And uh, this lot was owned by Mary Foote Henderson, the, the famous uh, wealthy um, uh, person who lived down the street in her castle with her, with her uh, former uh, senator husband. And it was very influential, and, and she owned a lot of property. And she was advised uh, that the uh, uh, the Mormon Church, uh, sponsored by Utah Senator Reed Smoot, asked to purchase this lot 
And people advised her not to sell to the Mormon church. They said this, would, this was bad for the neighborhood. It would bring property values down, um, believe it or not. Um, but she uh, did not listen to them and sold them the place anyway. And uh, it, it's been a great addition to the avenue ever since. Uh, the biggest issue with this building is this is the that Utah the bird's eye marble finish. It um, it doesn't actually do very well in, in Washington weather, and uh, you know it comes from a much drier climate. And in the humidity of Washington, it, it's deteriorated a lot. Um, this is a, a a close up photo that I just took recently that shows some of the spalling on, on that marble. Um, a lot of work has been done to to maintain it, uh, and most of that has been done by the current owners, the Unification Church. The Mormons left in 1975. They uh, that's about the time they, they built their large temple up in Bethesda, and uh, this chapel had become a place uh, mostly um, uh, where singles would would meet to to worship and and the church didn't want they they were really pushing uh, a family oriented venues and so they kind of that was one reason along with the increasing costs of maintaining the building that they decided to leave uh, as others um, other congregations have too um, but uh, fortunately the unification church at least uh, which is obviously controversial in some ways has at least uh, been working hard to try to preserve the building. So we appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna move now to up the street a little ways to Park Road where the Shrine of the Sacred Heart is located. So be all, this will be one of, let's see, two more that I that I'll wanna try to uh, talk briefly about. Um, the, uh, uh, the sacred uh, shrine of the Sacred Heart was uh, built in 1922, as it says there. This was uh, not just a another parish church of the Roman Catholic Church. It was meant to be a shrine, a uh, a central point, similar to the Sacre Coeur Basilica in Paris. That this would be a a a, 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 a national prominence, as it were, not officially the national. Um, you know, cathedral or anything of the Catholic, of the Roman Catholics, but nevertheless a, an important building on 16th Street, and it was designed uh, by uh, Frederick Murphy in this typical Romanesque revival design that was typical of of Roman Catholic churches at the time, and they they often were designed in this way to distinguish them from. The Gothic revival style that was that was more common with Protestant churches, and this the Romanesque style harkens back to to the time before the Reformation when European uh, Christians were all uh, were all together. So um, so it's very interesting to see this in in Catholic churches. The uh, this one in particular inside is really beautiful for the colored concrete that you could see in there. And this is a postcard view of, of the interior, of an, an old postcard view, shows some of the, the colored work. That's actually colored concrete that was designed uh, and installed by the famous uh, John Joseph Early, the, uh, the architect and engineer of, and concrete specialist, the so-called the man who made concrete beautiful, who worked in it on developing styles to embed colors and embed colored stones. Uh, to really make uh, a beautiful church. So, so uh, this is a great building. If you haven't gone in, I, I recommend taking a look sometime at, at this church. The last, uh, my time is running short, so I'm going to move right along to, to uh, the last one I want to mention, which is the 19th Street Baptist Church up at 16th and Crittenden Streets. And it is, it's a beautiful, as you can see, this is a white limestone building. It was built in 1951 uh, for the B'nai Israel uh, 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 Jewish congregation that uh, they, they built this. They had uh, Harry Brandt as the architect design this, this lovely building. 
And uh, um, that, it, that congregation, B'nai Israel, had been in, in Columbia Heights and they were looking for a larger building and they came to 16th Street, uh, the first of, of several major congregations, Jewish congregations that moved to 16th. There are two large ones further up, uh, Ohev Shalom and Tefereth Israel that are, that are still on 16th. And uh, it was in the 1970s uh, uh, that the congregation very reluctantly, because they had this beautiful building that was only 20 some years old, they, they very reluctantly decided they needed to move with, to keep up with their congregation uh, to, to Maryland. And so they moved to Montgomery County uh, because that's where all their, their members were. Um, and as I said, with great reluctance, they gave up this building, but it was, it was, their loss was, was the great fortune of the 19th Street Baptist Church, uh, which moved in. And uh, so here you have, here you have the 19th Street Baptist Church in a former uh, Jewish synagogue located on 16th Street. So it takes a little bit of uh, uh, stretching of the, of the, of, of the mind for a second to get a hold of that. Um, why is it the 19th Street Baptist Church on 16th Street? Well, that's, uh, the, the church decided to keep its, its traditional name. Here is the, the original uh, 19th Street Baptist Church downtown on 19th Street and I. It's not there anymore, but that's where it was. It's a very long standing distinguished congregation began as, far back as the 1830s, it was an offshoot of the First Baptist Church, uh, which incidentally is, is now located on Lower 16th Street. And uh, the, um, the, the 19th Street uh, Baptist Church was uh, a black congregation. Um, as I said, they separated from the First Baptist uh, in order to have their own church. And um, were here uh, until really until the 70s, they were being pushed out by development. And again, they're like many, many uh, congregations, their, their members were moving. So they, they moved up to that 16th Street building and have been there ever since. And the, the, the church now is, is very um, prosperous and distinguished. This is where President Barack Obama attended service with his family just before he was inaugurated. So, um, so a very important building. Um, so with that, I feel a little bit rushed because I think I've gone over my time, but I'm gonna turn it over to Peter now to talk about some houses. Peter, you're on mute still. There you right. go. Uh, yes, thank you, John, for that very nice um, introduction. And uh, as John says, we're gonna talk uh, about a different kind of house really. And to extend his uh, metaphor about uh, us approaching 16th Street as a biography. Um, and I'm now a couple, there we go. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the street in a phase that was probably his adolescence, maybe his terrible teens. And we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to hear about quite a bit of ego and also quite a bit of id in the process. Um, and then as somehow I hope that our book conveys uh, that, you know, today's 16th Street consists of shadow as well as substance. Although the great houses commissioned by Mary Henderson in the early 20th century still stand on Meridian Hill, just about all the Gilded Age mansions from Scott Circle South have vanished. Today, I'm gonna to briefly describe the human stories behind some of these great mansions and sketch how they fit into the trope of the Washington Great House that's really still with us. Uh, just after the Civil War, 16th Street resembled the outskirts of a village if you walk more than a few blocks north of uh, St. John's Church, uh, which would be right down, uh, let's see, uh, here. And, um, if, if you walk north, you'd find a, a working class community that's largely African American in the blocks between uh, L and M streets. Uh, and beyond that, uh, north of what's today Scott Circle, there'd be a lot of marshy, sparsely settled land that was known as the Slashes. Uh, excuse me.
little slides are jumping around a little bit, but we'll we'll get back to where we were. Uh, there we go. The draining of the slash has changed this landscape gradually, but a very important milestone came in 1874 with the placing of the statue of General Winfred Scott in a circle where 16th Street met had a dusty intersection of really, Massachusetts and Rhode Island Avenues. Uh, although the image of Scott, a three times failed presidential candidate trudging endlessly towards the White House was probably amusing to a lot of people. Uh, placing the statue here and next this part of the 16th Street into a, the formal line font city of monuments, circles, and squares. Uh, there was a lot of development started about that point, but for a few years, uh, the housing that was built north of the new circle remained very modest and middle class in, uh, in scale. However, within a few years, a knot of fine houses began to appear around Scott's statue. This first one, which you see kind of at center stage behind the statue, was built by Republican Senator Don Cameron. Shortly after the Pennsylvania State Senate elected Cameron to a full term in 1878, he commenced construction of this mansion, which faced the White House and it provided a very dramatic backdrop to the statue of General Scott and showed its, that its owner really did have a lot of political clout. The Cameron House was built for entertaining and conviviality, but the Senator and his much younger wife Lizzie had a deeply unhappy marriage. Uh, Don Cameron had a reputation as being a bit of a brute and Lizzie Cameron soon began spending most of, her, most of her time in Europe. And within a few years, Don abandoned the house and moved back to Lafayette Square. Uh, in 1881, a lot to the rear of the Cameron mansion was purchased by newly elected representative George Robeson, a Republican from New Jersey. Robeson was a scandalous figure. While serving as Grant's Secretary of the Navy, he was rumored to have amassed a fortune of more than $300,000 while earning an annual salary of $8,000. An admiral had nicknamed him the Cuttlefish for his ability to confuse investigators by generating clouds of ink. Robeson and his wife entertained lavishly and they likely built their 25 room mansion to advance his political ambitions. However, just about a year later, Robeson's aggressive pursuit of a Senate seat started a feud with a very powerful Republican who then supported his Democratic opponent in the congressional election. His 1882 defeat found him more than $60,000 in debt. And then as the Washington diarist Mary Logan wrote, quote unquote, the auctioneer's voice was heard in the chambers of this pretentious house crying, who bids, who bids? Mrs. Robeson took the children to Europe and obtained a divorce. Poor Georgie, as he was called in the newspapers, retreated to Trenton. A neighboring lot was purchased by George Trent Pendleton, a newly elected Democratic senator from Ohio. Gentleman George, as he was nicknamed, enjoyed his new house only slightly longer than Robeson enjoyed his. His statesmanlike advocacy of civil service reform angered party bosses back home, and he was not renominated. If Pendleton's and Robeson's political careers were short-lived, uh, their, ho their, their houses established an enduring architectural trend. Excuse me there. Their houses established an enduring architectural trend. Both were designed by the youthful Baltimore firm of Wyatt and Sperry, and they were early examples of the Queen Anne style, which would become wildly popular in Washington. Today, the upper stories of the Robeson house show the exuberant detailing that characterizes the Queen Anne style. Throughout the, although these Scott Circle houses were symbols of thwarted ambition, the neighboring Wyndham house reached the peak of residential irony. In 1881, Republican George Wyndham of Minnesota resigned his Senate seat to become President Garfield's Secretary of the Treasury. And he began building a brick and brownstone mansion across the street from the Cameron House. A week after Wyndham received his building permit, assassin Charles Gateau shot Garfield and ultimately killed Wyndham's dream as well as the president. Wyndham soon resigned his cabinet post and was reappointed to his former Senate seat. However, the following year, an opponent circulated a photograph of his mansion 
as a symbol of corruption and big city snobbery. Defeated for re-election, Wyndham had to abandon his house and move to New York to resume his legal career. The weaponizing of the Washington mansion as a symbol of vanity and corruption began a trope. In 1898, a popular columnist noted that, quote unquote, the day seems to have arrived when the building of a big house is almost the foreshadow of political ruin. The 1903 Rand McNally Guide to Washington intended that the curse was geographic. Reporting Scott's circle was called, quote unquote, calamity circle, because every person who built a house there died shortly afterwards or was met with misfortune. In the meantime, the blocks just north of Lafayette Square became the site of three great houses that remain legends nearly a century after their demolition. Their story began 25 years earlier on the Harvard University campus. Here a circle of artistically inclined bon vivants that included Midwestern and Nicholas Anderson, who was the son of a millionaire known as the father of American wine, and New Englander Henry Adams, the grandson and great-grandson of presidents, gravitated around a charismatic Southerner who was nicknamed Fez Richardson. Shortly after graduation, Adams befriended John Hay, President Lincoln's junior secretary, while he was assisting his congressman father in Washington. The Civil War scattered the classmates with Richardson, whose family fought for the Confederacy, writing out the war starting architecture in Paris. In peace, the four men's lives followed circuitous paths to an intersection in Washington. By the late 1870s, Hay had become restless managing his father-in-law's millions in Cleveland and returned to Washington. Here he reconnected with Adams and his wife, Marion, who was known by her childhood nickname Clover. The Adamses, John and Clara Hay, and another friend grew so close that Clover Adams nicknamed the group the Five of Hearts. The Five of Hearts assembled most evenings in the Adams rented house on Lafayette Square until Hay was forced out of the city by the new Garfield administration and left, left town. Nicholas Anderson had risen from private to brevet general in the Union Army, but he returned from the war to find that there was no room for him in the family business. Chafing at life in Cincinnati, he became part of a new class of wealthy and cultivated people who migrated to Washington for the city's cultural and social life. He soon purchased a coal and wood yard at 16th and K Streets and hired his classmate Richardson, who had become one of the most renowned architects in the United States to design his house. A year later, Adams proposed that he and Hay commission their classmate to reunite two pair of the five of hearts in adjoining houses, 16th and H. Although each of these monumental houses had a highly individual artistic identity, I'm gonna to touch on some common themes. Anderson soon learned that commissioning a Richardsonian house was perhaps more challenging than staging a military operation. Richardson was not only immersed in every detail, but at times he moved in with the Anderson family. As Nicholas wrote to his son, quote unquote, he bullies and nags everybody. He makes great demands upon our time and service. He must ride, even if he has to go over to square. He gets up at noon and he has to have his meals sent to his room. Richardson endlessly seduced his client into adding embellishments. Anderson had expected to spend only $30,000 for his house, but he overran his budget more than threefold. Hay and Adams had very similar experiences. At 12,000 square feet, the Hay House, which faced St. John's Church across 16th, was the most elaborate of the three houses Richardson designed. The Hay House followed the floor plan of the typical Washington Great House. Its Great Hall, which was the locus for socializing, uh, was, one, was one of its most notable features. It had white mahogany wainscoting that was described as having, quote unquote, a finish like that of a piano, and a staircase that was so wide that 10 persons could walk up at a breast while being bathed in the light of the stained glass windows above. The Adams House, which was tucked behind the Hay House at the corner of 8th Street, has a story that's very much bound up with that of Clover Adams. Even more than her notably pessimistic husband, Clover saw the conventional Washington Great House as symbolizing the materialism, commodified social relations, and political corruption of the Gilded Era. Rather than the great hall or power that served as a stage for in insincere conversation and displays of social status, the Adamsons prevailed upon Richardson to design their home around, quote unquote, a library, a study next to it, 
a dining room beyond, which were intimate spaces for authentic interaction among friends and family. Sadly, while the house was under its construction, Clover grew despondent at the death of her father. On December 6, 1885, she drank photographic chemicals in the parlor of the Adams rented house. Three weeks later, Henry Adams, a widower, moved into the new house whose plans so embodied the principles his wife described in her letters. In part because of the circumstances of Clover's death and in part because of its unconventional design, some observers interpreted the Adams house as a symbol of loneliness that represented madness rather than originality. By 1920, a popular Washington guidebook baselessly claimed that Clover had demanded the house have a special door cut for the passage of spirits and cruelly called Henry, quote unquote, a strange man, a brooding man who is worth knowing and thinking about only because he so markedly shows how a man may fail, even though he is carefully prepared to succeed. The Adams House's reputation as a foreboding house of evil spirits was only ironic, and it was also inaccurate. Adams biographer Joseph Douglas Crater, who interviewed numerous visitors to the house, suggested that most were impressed by its cheerfulness and its sumptuous decoration. He noted that, quote unquote, in all these rooms, there was a sense of color and light. Although these appeared built for the ages, none of the three Richardson houses stood for even 50 years. Yet today they're counted among the architect's masterworks and are considered to be among the most distinguished houses ever built in Washington. Their construction is evidence that supposedly provincial Washington was much more open to leading edge architecture than is generally supposed. Over the next decades, numerous impressive Richardsonian Romanesque houses succeeded them on 16th Street, as well as other boulevards. Most of the houses we've discussed so far were built on empty lots, but their construction nonetheless represented gentrification fueled by rising land values. By 1900, most of the long established African-American residents in the blocks between L and M streets had been displaced as their houses were bought up and replaced by the houses of wealthier whites. Judging by the posted signs, these circa 1900 photographs show modest working class homes likely being sold for demolition. Despite the racism of the times, several prosperous members of the African-American community managed to build substantial new houses in these blocks. They included John F. Cook, an important city official and political leader. By 1920, nearly 20 women had commissioned houses on 16th Street. They included modest dwellings for boarding housekeepers, as well as what was perhaps the most splendid mansions of Washington's Gilded Era. This was the Chandler Hale House, erected by Letitia Chandler in 1890 to 1001 16th Street. The Robeson, Wyndham, and other Scotch Circle mansions were trophy houses for political victories. And the three Richardson houses were the citadels of an elite social class. Chandler's house was a different type, the Washington dynastic house. Letitia was the widow of Senator Zachariah Chandler, a combatant of a controversial Republican presidential contender. Although old Zach, as he was called, had been dead for a decade, Letitia required a great house for herself, her daughter Mary, and Mary's husband, Senator George Hale of Maine. Senator Hale was a rising Republican star, and his further ascent required that he have a proper stage for entertaining. In 1889, Letitia Chandler purchased Cook's Corner, a family compound with two houses at the corner of 16th and K Streets that had been owned by John F. Cook, Jr. Her architects were the blue ribbon Boston firm of Roch and Tilden, which excelled at building summer mansions and enclaves like Bar Harbor that were favored by rich Washingtonians. The Chandler Hale House was soon acclaimed as one of the most beautiful in Washington. Its bow arch symmetry was accentuated by exquisite craftsmanship. The diamond shaped inserts, sorry, in these second floor windows uh, was, was made of sheets of marble that were shaved so thin as to be translucent. They were said to cast a subtle glow in the rooms beyond that varied with the season and hour of day. The Chandler Hale House decor captured the more conventional sensibilities of the Gilded Age in a way that the more austere and avant-garde Richardson houses had not. Its decor might be called maximalist today. 
And it was said to, quote unquote, vibrate in richly colored and textured stew of bewildering and unrelated patterns. Its interior was of such note that it was recorded by the pioneering female architectural photographer, Francis Benjamin Johnson, featured in national magazines. The piano over here in the left corner was newsworthy. It was cited by the Washington Post as evidence of the Hale's refined good taste as they had selected a Rosewood instrument, instrument rather than one of the vulgar gilded models that was preferred by the real nouveau riche. As a dynastic venture, the Chandler Hale House had very mixed results. It did launch a brilliant career. Mary Hale became a leading hostess, entertaining royally in her dining room that could have seated a regiment. But although Senator Hale became a powerful committee chair, any higher aspirations were dashed a few years later when he opposed the war with Spain that was backed by Republican leadership. Nonetheless, the Chandler Hale senatorial dynasty did enter a third generation when Frederick Hale was elected to his father's seat in 1911. The last great house that we'll look at today is a little too modern to truly represent the Gilded Age, but it reflects the Gilded Age sense of spirit and style. It was built as a variant on the dynastic house theme by Harriet Pullman, the widow of the sleep, Chicago sleeping car magnate. Pullman intended her son-in-law, Frank Loud, who had recently been elected to Congress, should have a social springboard so that in her words, he could easily reach the highest office in the land. Beginning in 1909, when members of Congress earned just $7,500 a year, Pullman poured over $400,000 into her house, including more than $100,000 for just finishes. However, this splendid house became yet another symbol of thwarted ambitions. Its grandeur remained secret for years because Loudon fell ill and his family returned to Illinois before it was completed. He never again held national office. The mansion stood empty until 1914 when it became Tsarist Russia's embassy, but then it soon reverted to a ghostly existence. During the 16 years between the Russian Revolution in 1918 and the United States recognition of the new Soviet regime, it sat with windows boarded, guarded by a former colonel of the Tsar's Imperial Guard. Shortly after the United States recognized the Soviet Union in 1934, Stalin's government hired Eugene Schoen, a New York designer famed for his motor and interiors to renovate the mansion. After a quick tour, Schoen announced that it would be a crime to do anything more than restore its original ornate decor. Soon the embassy was again ascending for fets with colossal sturgeon and caviar heaped in silver bowls. Local newspapers breathlessly reported these feasts that, quote unquote, in sheer lavishness surpassed anything of the kind in Washington, without noting that just a few years before, Stalin's great famine of 1932-33 had killed millions of Ukrainians. Perhaps you're left wondering what became of all these magnificent and monumental houses. The answer is that most of them were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. 16th Street had been largely designated as residential by the early zoning re regulations that John described, but hotels fit through a commercial loophole. The Hay Adams and the Anderson houses were only about 40 years old and in good repair when master row house builder Harry Wardman demolished them in the mid 1920s. Wardman built the Carlton Hotel on the site of the Anderson house while the Hay Adams houses were soon afterwards replaced by the hotel that bears the same name. In 1943, the Hale House and a trio of neighboring mansions were cleared to make way for the Stampa Hotel. The 1947 zoning law revisions had created a commercial development zone, doomed the remaining great houses south of Scott Circle, save for the Pullman House. Many great houses from Scott Circle North became rooming houses during the Great Depression and World War II as a last stage of their lives. But thankfully, some still exist to remind us of the Gilded Age's aspirations to architectural grandeur, as well as the ironies of these ambitions. All right. Well, thank you both so much for such a fascinating tour of 16th Street and all of these really important um, histories and historic places. So thank you both for that. Um, we are going to now um, 
see if the audience has any questions. Um, again, as a reminder, you can put those in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you joining us on Facebook, please feel free to ask your own questions. Um, Zach is over there and, and he will pass those along to us as well. Um, so let's see, I think we have a few to start off with. Um, somebody asks, is there truth to the story that there, um, that a very rich uh, woman declared that no Catholic church would be built on 16th Street and there aren't? Uh, I don't think that's quite true. Uh, there is the, the Shrine of the Sacred Heart, which I pointed out and described, is basically on 16th Street. Officially, it's slightly off. It's on a, a, a slight... Uh, uh diagonal street that goes off it's called pine street but that's really just a tiny jog essentially the the church is on 16th street so uh i don't think that's true and presumably the the individual um the unnamed individual might be mary foot henderson and she was actually quite open to lots of different denominations as i described she was the one that that overruled her advisors who told her don't sell that site to the to the Mormons. She went ahead and did that. She sold the also sold the site to the Unitarians across the street. Mm -hmm. So I don't think she owned the site where Sacred Heart is, but I don't have any reason to think she opposed having a Catholic church in the area. Yes, I, one one little thing to elaborate on something John said earlier. Is that Mary Henderson, when the Mormons wanted to buy the, the site for the Mormon uh, chapel, some of the people who opposed doing it, and actually I believe made their, their opinions known to Mary Henderson, were Protestant clergymen from other churches in the area uh, who, who were opposed to giving the Mormons a foothold, and she stood up to them. Mm. I, don't, I don't, you know, it, it's not purely probably a matter of her, her tolerant attitude that she did uh, you know, share some of the beliefs of the Mormon church regarding alcohol and, and tobacco mm. and stimulants. But you know, it, it's, it's, she, was, she was not a very democratic figure, but you know, she did have her moments. Mm. Um, let me see. Um. Who designed the original 19th Street Church building downtown? Do you know? Uh, that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry mm -hmm. to say. Um, it's a, it was a wonderful a Victorian building built mm -hmm. in 1871. Uh, I don't know the, off the top of my head who the designer was. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Um, let's see. Somebody else asked, uh, why was the neighborhood called the Slashes? Ah, well, that's, a, that's, an, that's another whole subject there. Um, but I'll kind of dip into it quickly. The, the part of 16th Street that goes from uh, about uh, L Street north to, to uh, Florida Avenue, which is the, the foot of Meridian Hill, was originally quite a marshy place. I know uh, my fellow historians bristle whenever someone says that Washington was built on a swamp uh, because it wasn't. But nevertheless, there were some pretty swampy areas. And one was this area called the Slashes. It was called the Slashes because it was so thick with, with undergrowth that if you wanted to go through, the only way you could get through was by slashing your way through. <laughs> and uh, and there was a, a stream running through it called Slash Run, which is uh, uh, led it to be very very marshy and swampy. And eventually, in the in the regime of of the famous uh, Governor Shepard, um, the uh, that that stream was buried as a sewer, as as many others were throughout the city. And that allowed the, the land to dry up and, and be uh, suitable for development. So that's, so that's why there's the, the, uh, the marshes of, of 16th Street are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Marie asked, uh, are these images facing north? I think it was during your part of the presentation, Peter. And 
if it helps, maybe Marie, you know, when the recording's out, if you see which ones specifically you're asking about, you can like email us and we can help you out with that unless you know, Peter. Uh, no, no, and I'd be glad to follow up on that. I, I would say, you know, 16th Street runs north south, so most of them would be facing east or west, but there probably are there are some north where the camera was looking for or something. We we work that out. Yeah. Um, and I'll put our email in the in the chat in a moment. Uh, it um, might be, I'm I'm just thinking it might be the Scott Circle pictures, because you didn't say which mm -hmm. way you were heading on. Oh yeah, no, that's that's correct. If it is Scott Circle, the one that shows, you know, is looking head on at the horse's face, that's that's pointing north. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's why the we were, you know, the reference to the General Scott plodding south towards the White House. Uh, and he mm -hmm. never did quite get there. Mm, okay. <laughs> Um, for both of you, which is your favorite building on 16th and why? Oh my. That was probably a tough one. <laughs> I, I would have to say, I'll, I'll take a wait. I think we may, we may actually have the same one or maybe not. I don't know. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess to me, 16th Street, you know, I, I lived on it for a couple of periods and John grew up off of it. And, uh, you know, uh, to me, writing the book was a little bit like there's a person you know, and then suddenly you get to know them super well in a shorter time. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit, what I think, the relationship I, I've had with 16th Street. So it, it becomes very hard if you know somebody so well to separate out what it is you most love about them. So it's a long way of saying, I, 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 don't, I guess I don't really have a favorite, but I love a great many of them. Yeah, I I, I kind of tend to agree. Um, there are there's so many great buildings. Um, perhaps uh, I might say the the Scottish Rite Temple at Sixteenth yeah. uh, and yeah. and R. I think that is or S. Yeah. Um, beautiful building. And and uh, the person could say, well, John, if you like that one so much, how come you didn't talk about it in this houses of worship? Um, and that is because it's not actually a temple. It's not a, a religious organization at all. It's a it's a, the temple of the Masons. So it's a fraternal group mm. that owns it. But it's a magnificent neoclassical uh, building uh, based on a, 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 a Turkish mausoleum from the from the ancient times and was the first great building designed by John Russell Pope in in Washington, the architect of Jeff, the Jefferson Memorial and the, National Gallery of Art. So it's a it's a magnificent building that that and I know Peter it's a favorite of his as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, that would be the one I would vote for too. So, yeah. <laughs> um somebody else is wondering um were there any protests when these mansions were destroyed? N not really before World War II. Mm -hmm. Um they had kind of run their life cycle in a lot of people's minds. And, you know, a lot of them had become sort of deteriorated. They were rooming houses, you know, they're cut up for offices. Uh, in the 1960s, when the last of them were being torn down, uh, and there are two particular ones. One was the Tuckerman House. They were more down towards, uh, you know, the I Street, you know, on the lower mm -hmm. edge. There were some crusades to, to, you know, to preserve them in some way that ended up being futile. But there was some interest at that point, and that was sort of the immediate, you know, uh, predecessors to the struggles that created the historic preservation law, which mm -hmm. today have made, you know, most of, much of 16th Street a historic district, where that mm -hmm. can't happen. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that the, uh, you know, the people just didn't conceive of historic preservation as something that that could happen. They it, they just didn't think about that. And uh, for example, when the Hay and Adams houses, uh, Harry Warman was going to tear those down, um, there was there were objections. There were people that wrote articles in the newspaper yeah. saying this isn't a good idea. And he actually backed off temporarily for <clears throat> for a, a couple of years, and instead he he tore down the the Nicholas Longworth house uh, mm -hmm. and and built the Carlton Hotel there. And then he came back a few years later and tore down the Hay Adams houses anyway. And uh, there wasn't any, there were no legal ways to stop anyone from, from tearing anything down. And people didn't feel, uh, didn't, didn't think that there was anything they could do. So there, were, there would be occasionally 
um, people would, would publicly express dismay, but that was about all that ever happened. Yeah. Before, before as, as Peter said, before the historic preservation movement began to, to uh, gel in the 1960s and, and then led to obviously the creation of, of the DC Preservation League's predecessor in 1971. Um, let's see. Kind of a little bit kind of going off of that. Um, are there historic markers documenting the location and or history of the houses and churches you have described that are now gone? Wow. Our book. Yeah. There yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> there you go. That's right. And um, by and large, I mean, there are a few surviving you know, buildings that uh, have have plaques on them that, you know, indicate they're on the National Register or contributing buildings for the historic district. But uh, of the of the lost houses, I don't really think so. You know, they, they exist as, you know, our, our, our book is a memorial and there are some other books that mention them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and there are layers of history here. The Peter talked about the Chandler Hale house that was built in uh, the, or 1902 or, or thereabouts, and that was on. That's at the the uh, northeast corner of 16th and K, um, and that's a beautiful mansion that was torn down to make way for for the uh, Statler Hotel, what's now the Capitol Hilton Hotel. But um, that even that, um, what was torn down to make way for Chandler Hale was the original home of of Reverend John Francis Cook Jr., the, the really uh, major figure in, the, in, in uh, uh, 19th century African-American culture and the community in DC, the founder of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church. So there was a, there was a landmark there, it was torn down to yeah. put this other landmark, which was then torn down to put the hotel. So, there are, mm -hmm. there are layers of history that need uh, commemoration, and and they're I, they're probably not that well marked. I don't think. Mm. No, there is the 16th Street Historic Trail, which makes you know is an attempt at doing that, and that and a very valuable one and a long overdue one. But you know, I, I I think I think John would agree there should be much more done in that in that area. Mm -hmm. I, I think just as a matter of justice. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, somebody in the chat is wondering, um, was the tower of the Mormon church deliberately designed to resemble that of the Unitarian church across the street? Uh, yeah, no, I don't think that was the, 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 the connection. It, it worked out nicely. Um, it adds a sort of a nice symmetry and, and, and beauty to the street. But uh, the, the Mormon chapel was really echoing the design of the Mormon tabernacle in, in Salt Lake City. That was mm -hmm. the main inspiration for that. And uh, I don't think that was specifically supposed to reflect uh, all souls. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, and I see that Joe kind of asked me, we kind of talked about this already, but like was the demolition of these grand homes a driving force for historic preservation in the 70s? Great question. And I don't know if you had any other thoughts or anything. I, I think it was part of the substrata that those were based on. There are a few famous cases that really put historic preservation or seem to put preservation over the over the top. Realistically, they wouldn't have done that without the loss of some of these earlier houses. And uh, I'm particularly thinking about the Tuckerman house, which is a very beautiful mm. Romanesque revival house there at 16th and I that was Many people thought Richardson had designed because it was so good. In fact, some people thought it was better than the Richardson houses, that they had taken his ideas and refined them and made them more robust in a way. And that, that was torn down. I believe that's the one that became the Motion Picture Association mm. headquarters is there. And there, there was quite a bit of interest, even among government agencies at uh, preserving that. And then it just came up, you know, I, I think the Motion Picture uh, organization really wanted it down. Yeah, that uh, was, and, and that was listed in the original 1964 inventory of historic sites that, that was the, the first uh, list of historic sites of the city. And the trouble, as Peter well knows, uh, with, with that mm -hmm. iteration of, 
of historic preservation was that there was no legal um, uh, method behind that list to protect any of those sites. So there were hearings held about the Tuckerman House and, and the house across the street, which was also torn down, uh, had been there a long time. Uh, but um, ultimately, you know, uh, and, and the MPAA said, oh, we tried to, you know, get buy some extra room next to this and we couldn't get it and blah, blah, blah. And so we have to tear it down, sorry. And, uh, you know, and that was it. Nobody, nobody could do much about it until we had an historic preservation law. Mm. Yeah, it used to largely be preservation was a matter of shaming people not to tear things down. And, you know, thankfully we moved beyond that. You know, these, these, these houses were kind of some of the martyrs to that cause in the end. Um, Joe is also wondering, did Embassy Row on Mass Ave become a later location for grand homes? Oh yeah, no, it, it definitely did. And, and even the lower part of uh, Massachusetts Avenue, you know, by, by what became DuPont Circle, which I believe the Shepherd uh, Territorial Government created, laid out DuPont Circle, I believe I have that right. Uh, and and kind of extended you know Mass Avenue that uh, as a location for fine homes, but yeah, Massachusetts Avenue was a big uh, you know location for grand homes, and you know of course Connecticut was too, uh, you know down in the more downtown part, and a lot of those of course have given way to commercial development too. Mm. Yeah, Embassy, Embassy Row on Massachusetts Avenue was really, there was the impetus behind that in, to some degree, was uh, Charles Glover, the, the famous uh, uh, banker that had been head of Riggs Bank and became a philanthropist and was very, very uh, influential in developing, uh, beautifying the city. And he was, he was one of the people that pushed for Rock Creek Park. And so he was, you know, we didn't we didn't really talk this time uh, about Mary Foot Henderson, uh, who lived at lived at on 16th Street and really wanted 16th to be beautified and become prestigious and have embassies, but she she was she was advocating for 16th Street while Charles Glover was advocating for Massachusetts Avenue. So the two of them there was there was a little bit of a rivalry for a while. <laughs> For a while there, and I think ultimately Massachusetts Avenue, for a combination of factors, um, there's more land that way. It's more to the west. Um, it it kind of ended up with more of the embassies in the long run, but um, but 16th Street certainly had a, a bunch of them and still has some. Great. Let's see. I think we have time for one, maybe one or two more questions. Let's see here. Um, is there a photographic archive of the mansions owned by congressmen and senators? Uh, no, not, not as such. There are some very good troves of, of information about various uh, of the houses. The Historical Society of Washington is some excellent material. Mm -hmm. And so does the People's Archive of the Public Library. And uh, the Library of Congress has some very good shots too. Uh, a lot of them are by the famous photographer I mentioned, the early female uh, architectural photographer, Francis Johnson. They're really great pictures. And they're the only record of some of the interiors of those houses, but there's no sort of one-stop place. And then some of the, some very great houses, there are really no known, you know, close up or, or detailed pictures of. We just have to imagine what they look like. Mm. Um, okay, so I guess the final question is, uh, when will there be an opportunity to buy the book in person and perhaps get it autographed? I think the DC History Center is selling um, autographed books, but it, what about any other opportunities? Well, we're going to be doing the DC History Conference on April 2nd, and I think well, there would probably be an opportunity to, you know, we'll bring our pens, I think, and <laughs> be an opportunity there. Uh, John, do you have some ideas? Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the history conference will be an opportunity. And as you mentioned, Melissa, uh, 
Peter and I have autographed a bunch of copies that are available from the DC History Center. So um, uh, please check in there and get them. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be some other talks that, that uh, in-person talks, because we're getting, fortunately now we're getting to this point where we're, where it's, it's starting to be safe to have, to have sessions like that. So we hope to have more coming up. Right. And I would say too, if, if anybody has been a member of an organization that might like to have us, you know, participate in then I think we'd, we'd be very happy to try and work that in, you know, maybe make some new friends and talk about the book a little. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm putting a link to the book again in the chat. Um, this is to its publisher, Georgetown uh, University Press. Um, so you can check that out as well. Um, Wait, let me see this. Oh, okay, so people just writing the chat. But anyway, so I just want to say as we close, uh, as we finish up here, uh, thank you both again for this. You know, congratulations on publishing this really fantastic book. I can't wait to get my own copy. And <laughs> for those of you who, you know, we didn't get to your questions, this is, I think, even more of a reason that you should go and get the book and, and you know, you find the answers in there. Um, but yeah, I will, I'm going to put our situation email in the chat if there were any other questions you know or anything feel free to email us and we'll pass it along to john and peter um but i want to thank you both again i want to thank our audience for joining us and i don't know if you had any other final words john or peter oh well, thank just, you we, yeah i'm sorry go ahead just just Yours. to say thank you melissa yeah. and thank you everyone who's who's tuned in to hear hear us today it's great uh as i said at the beginning we love being able to do this with DC Preservation League, which is dear to our hearts. So, uh, so this is great. Thanks very much, Peter. Yeah, I couldn't improve on that. That that's exactly how I feel too. And it's 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 been a great experience working with John to write the book and put it together. So, thank you to everybody. Thank you both.